All right, in this video, we will prove Burnside's theorem. So the theorem states that if your group has order given by a power of p times the power of q, where p and q are distinct primes, then g is solvable. Note that a corollary of this is that either g is not simple, or, of course, g is a prime cyclic group. To see why this corollary is true, remember the definition of solvable, or one of the equivalent definitions of solvable is that it has a finite derived series, and well, if that finite derived series is length greater than 2, then g has a non-trivial normal subgroup. And so if that finite derived series is length 1, then you have some arguing to do. Well, then G has to be an abelian group, and a, every abelian group is already solvable, so there's nothing interesting there. But for abelian groups, by the fundamental theorem of finite abelian groups, if you're not, if you're simple, you're this one, because if you're finite abelian. then you're isomorphic to a direct product of powers of cyclic groups. And actually, if there's more than one factor here, then you're not simple. And so in order to be simple, it has to be one has one cyclic factor, and if this prime is higher power than one, then it has proper subgroups. And every proper subgroup in an abelian group is automatically normal. So you're stuck with this case. All right, so let's attempt to prove this general theorem. And there is one lemma that we will assume without proof. We'll prove it later in the course. And the proof uses representation theory, and that's why we won't prove it yet. It says, if there exists a conjugacy class, in the group G, such that the size of the conjugacy class is a power of a prime, then G is either abelian, or is not simple. And of course, we have to make sure we're talking about a conjugacy class that's not the one containing the identity. So note here, by power of a prime, we are allowing one. So if you have a conjugacy class of size one, then you're going to end up in one of these two conclusions. Because if every conjugacy class is of size 1, you're in the case that you have an abelian group. Um, otherwise, all the elements of conjugacy classes of size 1, you might remember, together actually form the center. And the center is a normal, non-trivial normal subgroup. So it's worth remembering that. The center of the group. Every cent element in the center ends up being in its own conjugacy class. When we prove the conjugacy class equate the class equation, we had to uh, remember that fact in the proof, and so it's worth pointing that out here as well. So it's worth pointing out, although we've never actually really seen many examples of this. There are groups where the center is trivial, so there are groups where the only conjugacy class of size one is the trivial one. But this lemma still applies. If you have any conjugacy class that has a power of prime size, then your group is either billion or is not simple. All right, assuming that lemma is true, let's prove Burnside's theorem. So there are some cases that if a is zero, b 
is 0 or P equals Q. Then you're really working with a group with that's really only one factor. one prime factor. These are nilpotent groups. Well, they're P groups, actually. And we recall learning already that P groups are nilpotent, and nilpotent groups are solvable. So this theorem is only interesting when P is not equal to Q. and A and B are actually positive powers. So the proof is going to be induction <clears throat> on the order of G. And you'll see whatever the smallest examples are, they would probably be these cases we just covered right here, where one of the exponents was zero. So we're in the induction step specifically. And so we're going to look at a P, CELO P subgroup of G. And recall that its center is non-trivial. And so that means there exists an element in the center. We're going to turn this fact on its head. The fact that x is in the center of p means that for all y and p, yx equals xy. What does this mean? This means that p is a subgroup of the centralizer of x and g. because every element of P commutes with X. And what is the size of P? Well, it's a CELO P subgroup, so it has to be P to the A. It's the largest power of P that divides the order of G. And let's consider, let's let K be the conjugacy class of x in G. Remember, the size of the conjugacy class is the index in G of the centralizer of any element of that conjugacy class, so in particular, the, the size of the centralizer in G of x, or the index of the centralizer of G in G of X. What could this thing possibly be? Well, by Lagrange's theorem, it's the size of G divided by the size of the centralizer, G. We know P is a subgroup of the centralizer. So, P to the A, Q to the B, divided by what's downstairs has to be P to the A, Q to the C for some C. Q to the B minus C. So what do we see? we see that this conjugacy class is a power of a prime. Even if it's one, it's a power of a prime in the sense that the lemma cares about. So by our lemma, either G is abelian or it's not simple. K 
Case one, G is abelian. Um, well, then it's solvable because the definition of solvability is that you can find a sequence of normal subgroups such that the pairwise quotients are all abelian. Well, in this case, the sequence would just be the trivial subgroup normal and G. The quotient is G itself, and you're already done. So the only case that's interesting is that G is not simple. What does that mean? That means that there must exist a proper normal subgroup whose size is between 1 and all of G. Well then, what do we know? We know that the size of G has to be, I mean the size of N is P to the A prime, Q to the B prime. And it's strictly less than the size of G. So by induction, N is solvable. Similarly, G mod N is P to the A minus A prime, Q to the B minus B prime in size. Again, this is going to have to be smaller than G, so by induction hypothesis, G mod N is also solvable. So you found a normal subgroup who's, such that the normal subgroup and the quotient are both solvable. What we just learned about solvable groups is that if that happens, then the overall group is solvable. And so yes, this is a pretty um, abstract proof, but it kind of makes sense. You're proving a pretty strong theorem about a group, knowing nothing about it other than its order. It's kind of powerful. It tells you that if your order is a product of powers of two distinct primes only, then you must be a solvable group. And it sort of tells you how to construct one of the series. Uh, it tells you somewhere there must be a normal subgroup, and then you just need to piece together the derived... Uh, well, we've discussed this before. You can piece together a normal series for n, and then a normal series for the quotient. Granted, of course, the hard part is that it relies on this lemma, so it doesn't exactly tell you how to find the normal subgroup without going through the proof of that lemma. And I think in practice, finding the normal subgroup and other methods is probably quicker. What I mean there is that at least for low, small powers of A and B, you could probably try to prove that the CELO subgroups themselves are normal. Just obviously for arbitrary powers, I suspect that's hard to prove, and for arbitrarily large groups that there are probably counterexamples. And so in complete generality, using CELO theory to find the normal subgroups isn't going to work, which is part of the reason why we have to use this much stronger lemma. Yeah, I'd have to think very carefully. I'll probably stop there thinking about it, but I think it's possible that there exists groups that satisfy this condition that their order is a product of two powers of dis two distinct primes with the property that neither CELO subgroup is actually normal. But the construction would be beyond the scope of the course. It would probably involve group cohomology in order to construct it accurately. And if it doesn't come from that construction, then chances are one of the two CELO subgroups would be normal and that the group would be a semi-direct product. I mean, at the very least, the thing we know you could prove is that if P were normal in G, where P is the CELO P subgroup, then G would have to be the semi-direct product. I mean, G would have to be isomorphic to the semi-direct product with P in the CELO Q subgroup because their product, their orders are co-primes, so they have to their product has to be the whole group.
and their intersection has to be the trivial subgroup. Similarly, if Q happened to be normal, so as soon as one of the two Stela subgroups is normal, you have a semi-direct product. But the question is whether or not there's cases where neither of them are normal. Although it's interesting to note, you have this strange phenomenon that even if neither of them are normal, they both have the feature that their product as a set generates the whole group and they intersect. This is called being complementary groups. And we'll see that when we talk about Philip Hall's theorem next time. But you can have this situation without having this feature. The difference between these two is that this feature requires one of the groups to be normal and this feature does not.